So uh, those of you who know me know how dangerous it is to try to get me to speak for 10 minutes. Um, but I'm going to try, and, and I just thought of a few things that maybe would be good to just frame things. And then I'm going to speak more um, off the cuff and a little more extended remarks t at the end of the day tomorrow. But I, I was thinking about the workshop we had over the weekend, and I wanted to highlight uh, a phrase that came up during our discussions, and the phrase was shared risk. We were speaking about a vision of investing. You're going to, tell, you can, you're going to be able to tell that I wrote these remarks at 4 a.m. this morning. We were talking about a vision of investing that is less about minimizing risk and maximizing return for an investor and more about sharing risk between a farmer, a food entrepreneur, and an investor. Shared risk. You can see that right away, as soon as we begin peeling the onion of financial convention, we get into some very fundamental questions of economics and culture, language and intention. What does shared risk mean? So I want to give another kind of shout out to Douglas and Joel because they beautifully demonstrated last night the extent to which language matters. We need to explore new language if we're going to find our way to a new conversation and to healthier culture. I've had the great privilege of traveling around the country for the past five years since my book came out. Notice I got the plug for the book in there. I've learned, and your presence here today confirms, that there are many, many people who really are hungry for a new conversation. We are tired of our complicity in a broken system, complicity that is reinforced every second of every day by our money zooming around the planet in ways that are so fast and so abstract and so complex that no one can fully understand it. Our money zooming around the planet to smokestacks in China and factory farms in Iowa and conflict mineral operations in Africa, and who knows where else doing who knows what. Our money in hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives, even today, after the Great Recession. The scope of these problems and the significance of the change that is required point to a new language and a new conversation and a new direction. Take the phrase, slow money. Put the word slow in front of the word money, and immediately very fundamental questions arise. There are many of them, but there are a few that are key, and, and I think probably half the people in the room have heard these and half hasn't, haven't, so I'm going to repeat the three questions in the slow money principles. What would the world be like if we invested 50% of our money within 50 miles of where we live? That we could have an hour discussion just on, on any of these. What if there were a new generation of companies that gave away 50% of their profits? What if there were 50% more organic matter in our soil 50 years from now? These are questions about the relationship between finance and culture, between money and the soil, between the local and the fiduciary. Anybody here not know what the word fiduciary means? You have to leave immediately. One poor guy raised his hand over here. No, you don't have to leave. Don't worry about it. It will become clear. They raise questions about a new vision of investing in the 21st century. I hope you've all by now seen this pamphlet, which is out on the table, my new pamphlet. It's called Commons Nth, Common Sense for Post-Wall Street World, but I want to draw your attention to the sub-subtitle. A simple, pragmatic, and neighborly call to action for the age after... By the way, I, I should have Joel Salatin up here doing this. He would do it way better. A simple, and pragmatic, and neighborly call to action for the age after rogue computer algorithms, CDOs, GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, food deserts, desert storms, and all those endowments, pension funds, mutual funds, and other ungodly, humongous institutional pools of capital that are about to discover conscientious investing saying no to oil and yes to soil. Well, I thought there would be more laughter than applause, but that's, I'll go with the applause. Because I'm going to say, so now I got the laughter, which is good. Laughter gets us out of the left side of our brains. I warned you about this theme. Um, and to the right side of our brains and to our hearts so that we can feel the possibility of something very different. We can call this different thing slow money. We can call it conscientious investing. We can call it nurture capital. It's just fine that we use many different terms because what, we're after, what we are after is diversity. Not just arithmetic diversification but actual diversity, ecological, economic, and cultural diversity. So we must keep exploring new language that can point us in this new direction. Since we're in a particularly political moment with our midterms barely behind us, 
I feel compelled to say that my thinking about this new direction um, takes me away from political slogans and venomous TV ads paid for by warring politicians who are paid for by warring special interests. I thought I'd get a little cheap applause from that. <laughs> we need nuanced, authentic conversation. Anything less is a form of violence, a form of intellectual violence. What we want is less violence, less warring special interests, less warring all the way around. Money, money that is too fast and financial institutions that are too big and securities that are too complex are embedded in and enable a culture that is rooted in violence. Not only the kinds of overt violence that uh, confront us every day, I think we were all very aware of Joel's use of the term bioterrorism last night, he just kind of snuck that in there, but also the kind of everyday economic violence that is not as obvious, but is just as insidious and destructive. Violence of the virtual that draws our attention away from the places where we live. Violence of dumbed down political debate. Violence of chemicals and waste and eroded soil and eroded, eroded mining residues that are flowing down the Ohio River right outside these walls. Violence of a food system that produces mountains of cheap calories, but also produces pandemics of obesity and diabetes. These are all the results of the violence of an economic system that puts seemingly impenetrable layers of complexity and intermediation between us and the things our money is financing. I was fortunate to get an op-ed piece in the Louisville paper a couple of days ago. I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, it was right under a picture of Mitch McConnell on his re-election. I'm not kidding. It's a crazy placement. But the reason I'm bringing it up is, um, in the course of writing that, I wrote the following sentence. At some point, the pursuit of happiness must become the pursuit of non-cheapened food. I, I share this because writing that op-ed and writing these opening remarks and the conversations we're gonna have in this room over the next couple of days are a constant process of, of exploration, personal exploration, exploration and, and a collective exploration. That is why we've organized this event with chairs on the stage. There's gonna be a lot of conversations, not very many talking like this with some one person talking to the audience. And we're hoping there'll be a lot of audience participation. Even the entrepreneur presentations, when we do them, are not gonna be traditional at the podium PowerPoints. They're gonna be done in conversation style. So, uh, before I bring my, my uh, friend Mary Berry to the stage, I wanna do quick, two quick other things. First, I wanted to recognize the we that is in this room. Uh, over these next two days, more than 800 people will be attending this, this conference from 46 states and two foreign countries. Uh, I forgot to check before I came up here, so I don't know how many people are registered online. It's at least 1,500, it might be 2,000 now, and it's probably gonna go up during the course of the proceedings. And, and by the way, we are gonna do a few things later on today to um, try to engender more enthusiasm for the online crowd and to try to promote the Bitcoin campaign so we can get some more dollars uh, to vote uh, tomorrow. So we'll get to that later. Um, I wanted to identify the fact that about 100 of the 800 people registered are professional investors, meaning angel investors or foundation executives, um, investment managers, uh, or, uh, or just wealthy angels who are used to thinking about money a lot and making private investments. So about 100 of the 800. About 300 to 350 self-registered as emerging investors, meaning people who have some money to do something with, are thinking about it, want to align their values and their investments, may or may not have ever done anything like this. And then the, the, the other, whatever that is, three or 400, are students, community members, farmers, uh, people who got scholarships or were given free passes. We are an NGO, so once we kind of hit our numbers, we try to make it as, as participatory as we can for the community. Um, from a financial standpoint, the thing that's kind of crazy and interesting about that is checks that have been written, uh, that over $38 million has gone over the last several years to over 350 small food businesses, uh, mostly in the US, with a little bit in France. You can applaud. It, it is a drop in the bucket, it's a drop in the bucket, but we're gonna get some other drops in there and see what we can do. Um, the interesting thing is th those checks range in size from $3 million to $25. So it's really important to feel that, and in this room, we, you, represent those constituencies, everybody from very wealthy angels to people who have 25 bucks to chip in. So I encourage you to enjoy that and get to know each other over the next couple of days. All right, I saved the, the weirdest for the last. So I was thinking about all of these issues, culture, language, 
thinking that investing is kind of the opposite of culture in many ways. It's about transactions, not relationships. A lot that we could talk about there. And I thought, um, thinking about the pitch fest and the entrepreneurs, uh, how many people in this room have heard the phrase elevator pitch? Most people, interesting. That's how far the investing culture has permeated the general culture. Everyone knows what an elevator pitch is. You know, you get 30 seconds, you gotta pitch yourself to the venture capitalist. So I thought, if we're going for culture instead of so much transactions, what would be the opposite of an elevator pitch? Anybody wanna guess what, what I came up with as the opposite to an elevator pitch? Someone actually got the answer. She said, she said a poem, but it's an elevator poem. So here we go. Now, it's called Notes Towards a Slow Money Elevator Poem because I didn't have time to really get it to be an actual poem. Notes Towards a Slow Money Elevator Poem. Thank you for your understanding. <laughs> One, oil fuels dollars, money fuels wars, bombs make NPK, earthworms scatter, finance becomes electronic chatter, Twinkies are not okay. Two, there's this thing called soil that really isn't a thing at all, but rather a mysterious vessel in which agents of the God's goodwill can gather and disperse. Symbiosis comes here to undress. Imagination comes here to kiss decay. Reason and efficiency, shallow cost, relentless calculation, fiduciary intervention. All are muted here by humus and humility, Impulse of root, percolation of intention. Memory of mycorrhizae, mystery of time. The sweet, gentle insistence of a lunar day. Three, put a pitchfork in that elevator pitch. There, there is a poem in them thar loam. Four, Wendell Berry settles all accounts. Let, let us love him now in no small amounts.